What's up everyone, welcome to Okuma Studies, and today we're discussing the era of precision timekeeping. This era covers from about the mid 1500s uh, to the modern times. And uh, last time we left off, we left off at the, at the creation of the Verge Escapement, which allowed for tower clocks to be, the first tower clocks to be built. Today, the first thing on our list is the pendulum clock. As the mechanical clocks continued to miniaturize, pendulum clocks came into existence. In the 1580s, Galileo discovered that the pendulum swing could be used to regulate clocks. However, he never constructed the clock. The first creation would be done by Christian Huygens, a Dutch scientist. This was done in 1656. Early versions were within one minute per day. Let's go to the side a bit so you can see pictures better. These were within, the first were within one minute per day and later versions were within 10 seconds. The pendulum clock then spread to England. William Clement designed the first grandfather clock as we know them today. He cr developed the anchor escapement. And the anchor escapement basically allowed for the pendulum swing uh, to go from 90, sorry, 100 degrees so the swing, you know how there's the back and forth on the pendulum? It went from about 100 degrees. <clears throat> and if you imagine 100 degrees, it's a right angle. So if you twist it like that and add a little bit extra, so it's about this. The pendulum had to swing about this far, right? And these pendulums were, I don't, I'm not exactly for sure the length, but you know, it took these took up a lot of space. You have this giant one meter long thing swinging about. Um, the anchor escapement allowed them to, the angle went from 100 degrees to in between four and six. So the grandfather clock was kind of squeezed in and um, and became taller. And this allowed it to be easily put into people's homes and became more of a personal household item. Advancements continued under the Jesuits and other scientists, the spiral hairspring. After the mainspring was invented in the early 15th century, portable clocks were sprung forth. However, these were not accurate until the spiral hairspring came into play. Invented either by Robert Hoke or Christian Huygens, either, it was developed. So Hoke developed a straight hairspring, and Huygens developed the spiral hairspring. Either way, Huygens' design is the one we still use today. And if you're wondering what a spiral mainspring is, I will show you. If you look at the heart of the wristwatch, you see that thing that's moving back and forth. That right there is the spiral hairspring. So now you know who invented it. And we're going to get into, you know, what that meant. The introduction of the balance spring allowed the portable wristwatch a harmonic oscillator, much like the pendulum and pendulum clocks. So Harmonic oscillator, what is this big fancy word? But I, I look at it like this, like harmony. Harmony is like music, and music is rhythm, right? Basically, the, the hairspring is, is the rhythm of the wristwatch, you know? That's why we kind of like to call it the heart. This caused watches to go from, in, from inaccuracy of a few hours a day to 10 minutes. I'll repeat that. The spiral hairspring allowed from wa allowed watches, portable watches, pocket watches, and things related to that manner, to go from a few hours in accuracy a day to within 10 minutes. Huge difference. And this allowed the invention of the uh, the introduction of the minutes hand. So before you didn't even it, it was so inaccurate. There's no point adding a minutes hand in there. <laughs> but the balance spring wheel had a huge effect on timekeeping. We'll be looking at Christian Huygens more in depth at a later video. Inventing the hairspring, creating the first uh, pendulum clock, and he didn't dis he was a horologist. I believe he was also a physicist. He did a lot of amazing great things, and I, I believe Isaac Newton looked up to him. I would like to do, and we will, take up make a video about uh, you know Christopher Huygens. And uh, we'll, we'll touch a little bit on pocket watches, and due to the advancements listed above, pocket watches were put into the mainstream relatively, because, I mean, let's be honest, most people, you know, probably couldn't afford a pocket watch for a very, very long time. 
marine chronometers. This is very, very cool. Marine chronometers are used as time standards to determine long longitude, longitude by celestial navig celestial navigations. Navigation. Sailor would sailors would determine longitude by comparing their local high noon to the clock, usually set to green, which means time. So, from what I can understand, is it go okay? Um, the sun is 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 because you know I may be like the Earth's axis. Depending on where you are in the world, you might be able to tell. I mean, I'm not a sailor. I don't really know too much about this, but the fact that you you can t look at a, at a a clock and figure out you know by the whatever's going on in the sky above you where you are on the Earth longitude is longitude. I believe longitude is the um, the circumference part going east to west. It's just amazing to me. These had to be very accurate within 10 seconds a day and account for the harshness of life by the sea because you're on, you're on a ship, you're on this wooden ship, it's rocking, it's moving, um, you might have gotten in a sea battle, I'm just kidding, but you know, it's there's a difference between a tower clock sitting on land and a marine chronometer bouncing around, jostling around at sea. And the British government offered a $20,000 pound reward to anyone who could produce an accurate marine chronometer. This is due to, um, I, f I believe there was some incident in Sicily and they were just like, let's not have that, have that happen again. But later, this was claimed by the famous John Harrison. And I believe he was uh, on, the, on Britain's, on the UK's uh, top 100 uh, greatest, greatest British people or something. I don't, I don't know. But anyways, in 1735, Harrison built the first chronometer. Built the first chronometer. So, not not marine chronometer. He literally built the first chronometer. Chrono like you know, what we considered it. Yeah, he built the first one. He improved on his design for the next 30 years. These included bearings to reduce friction, weighted balances uh, to compensate for the ship's tilting, and and using. Two different element, two, two different metals to reduce expansion from heat. In 1761, his chronometer was tested at sea, and after 10 weeks at sea, it was five seconds off. Man, that's, that's I mean, like, let's just be real now. I mean, that's is that more accurate than quartz? You know what I mean? And it, it's it's on it's at sea. It's a mechanical object. Seven, remember, this is 1761. Crazy. We're gonna look at the electric clock. In 1815, Sir Francis Ronald of London published the forerunner to the electric clock, the electrostatic clock. This clock had its pros, but if but varied heavily due to weather. Later versions would prove more stable. God, I can barely speak today. Later versions would prove more stable. Alexander Bain, a Scotsman, was the first to invent and patent the electric clock in 1840. In 1841, he and John uh, Borwise patented the electromagnetic pendulum. I think the electric clock is kind of boring because what, what, do, we, what do we think of electricity and time? What do we think of? Quartz. The piezoelectric properties of quartz were found in 1880 by Jacques and Pierre Curie. Uh, paleo paleoelectric basically means there's an electric shock stored in quartz naturally. The first quartz oscillator was created in 1921 by Walter G. Caddy. The first quartz clock was built in 1927 by Warren Marison and J.D.W. Horton at the Bell Telephone Laboratories. I believe the first quartz uh, clock was more inaccurate than normal timepieces, but they were just like, it's just there to, the first ones were, once again I repeat, yeah, more inaccurate than, um, than mechanical timepieces, but you know, of course they developed it. And that was in Canada, by the way, where they developed the first quartz clock. And then over the, over the decades, 1929, 1940, 1950, 1960, um, quartz is just being tested and developed in laboratories like a lot of other um, uh, technologies. 
1929, quartz was used by the National Bureau's Bureau of Standards as the device that the U.S. based their time off of. So, by 1929, quartz, let's say you're in 1945 and you are a soldier and you listen to the broadcast and they tell you the correct time and you set your watch to the right time. That time you were hearing and listening on the radio was based off of a quartz device and that was in 1929. So quartz has really been in existence, quartz timekeeping has been in existence for a very, very long time. Uh, quartz was eventually replaced as the American standard of time by the atomic clock in the 60s. In 1969, the first quartz wristwatch was released, the Seiko Astron. Cool Seiko, cool, cool, cool. Making it in there somehow with your very, very prestigious history. And last but not least, we have atomic clocks. Atomic clocks are simply the most accurate time-telling device ever constructed. All other time forms are tested against atomic clocks. The idea was first suggested by Lord Kelvin in 1879. Only in the 1930s did this become practical due to advancements in um, technology, being able to actually um, I believe it was some, basically, you know, atomic research developed and, and this became a, like a possibility. The first atomic clock was created in, created, oh weird, I, I, sorry about this, I didn't actually include the date when the first atomic clock was created, but it was created by Louis Essen, and it was based off the KCM-1133 atom. This was built in the National Physical Labor Laboratory in the UK, and I'm gonna, I want to put this, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to put a little timestamp underneath me right now to, 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 to put when the first time a clock was created. The international system of units standardizes the proper, oh, I'm having a hard time. So the, the international system of units standardizes to the time, hmm. The, the International System of Units standardizes its time on the properties of cesium. They define a second as 9,192,631,770 cycles of radiation. Uh, which is, I believe it's some like fluctuation in the electro electrodes of this atom. But can you, that's the definition of a second. You know what I mean? You, you look it up and you go, oh, what's the definition of the word color or the, the word of a chair or, but a second, you don't really think about that. You think of more, all right, a second is just one, two, three. It's 60 seconds is how long I put my, my, um, my chicken bake in the microwave until it's cooked. Do you know what I mean? I, and this is, it's so accurate. The cesium clock that all of our time systems are based off of is accurate to the to th is accurate to 30 billionths of a second per year. So, sorry, all well, the horologists who came before, because everything you make has became, by time telling wise, completely obsolete, right? By the atomic clock, and. You know, we as watch guys, we go, oh, okay, look at all these amazing stuff, the verge escapement, all the, the marine chronometers, uh, mechanical devices. But you, you gotta admit, like, 30 billionth of a second? Billionths of a second? Can you just, can you even, I can't even fathom that, how accurate that is. And can you, and I, this also makes me think, like, back in the day, when a new device came out that allowed a uh, pocket watch to go from hours from within like three hours in accuracy to within 10 minutes it's like the same it's like the, the change there is just is the same uh the dress the drasticity the dramaticness oh gosh i can barely speak today i have no idea why but it's so interesting to just observe this whole uh, evolution of timekeeping we went from s water pots with holes in them you know, fill it up with water, that's a, that's time. To candlesticks with little lines, um, 
designated to go like go there. This is about an hour, two hourglasses, two sun from sundials to the first beginnings of uh, of mechanical clocks that are ran by water of all things or mercury to the verge escapement being created and this kind of starting this trickle of uh, technological advancements in the world of horology. And now, I mean, do you, I mean, do people, I mean, I don't really know, but do, can, is, an, an, is an atomic clock even a part of horology? Yeah, it is, right? Because it's the study of time. But horology, it's almost as if there's nothing more in the world of horology. It's almost like we've already found the goal. And I believe that's why horology has kind of, um, excuse me, uh, my eye, has kind of faded into obscurity. Because unlike physics or mathematics or computer programming or software engineering or even mechanical engineering or uh, any of that stuff, right? Uh, horology has kind of already found, it's already finished its purpose. 30 billionths of a second. A year, by the way, a year. I mean, by the end of the end of the universe, it might be like two minutes off. <laughs> so, that's it, guys. That's the era of precision timekeeping. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, give it a like. Um, I encourage you to do your own research on horology, whatever interests you. And if you have any suggestions of things you want me to take a look into. Leave a comment below. Email me, Akuma said, or Akuma's Arsenal at gmail.com. Thank you very, very much for watching. Akuma out.